Hello, hello Federico Campagna, and thank you for being with us today and for having accepting uh, our invitation to speak uh, in the context of uh, our online program at Index 2022. Um, my proposal to, to you is that we spend the next uh, 40 minutes, one hour speaking from uh, your book, Technic and Magic. This book I have here, so I'll show very quickly. Technique and Magic, the Reconstruction of Reality. Um, I think I would like just to, to mention um, uh, a little bit of your path. You are a, a philosopher. You are actually living in London. Um, and But you have... Um, um, Somehow a past that perhaps I would like to, to, to come back sometimes during the conversation, if you feel that it makes uh, also sense. That is, you, uh, before moving to London, you lived in Milan, where you were quite involved in anarchist and autonomist uh, movements, and also in street poetry collective that you created uh, also with uh, other street uh, poetry uh, poets. Today was Evelyn. Uh, then uh, you in, in um, 2007, you moved to London. You worked uh, in collaboration with Franco Berardi. You created critical theory platforms. Um, and you did uh, a PhD in Royal College of Art uh, with uh, the title Metaphysics and Metaethics in the Design of Strat Strategy Video Games. This is something that perhaps I will, uh, I will uh, come back. Um, you are now also, um, you published uh, recently a, a book uh, in 2021. You are also working at Verso Books. Um, and you are a philosopher in residence at Castello di Rivoli Contemporary Art Museum now during this year. Uh, and you host the podcast over Morrow's Library at Contemporary um, Art Center in Geneva. And this connects your work directly with the contemporary art context, that is also the context of Index uh, uh, Biennale. Um, and I think that after I would like to ask you about this relationship between what you propose in this book, the, the uh, space of uh, magic and this context. But um, in this book, um, you have this, um, I think that we make a call also quite a, a radical because it goes to the roots also, a uh, proposal of uh, reconstructing reality, uh, of somehow proposing uh, uh, another uh, system of reality different from the one that it's now dominant. And this dominant system, you call it the, the system of reality, of our own reality, as you say, um, that is the system of techniques. Uh, I would like to ask you if you can uh, summarize a little bit, how do you understand this uh, uh, system of techniques? Uh, perhaps starting from how can we uh, how can we describe a life that it's lived in the system of techniques? Uh... Ah, okay. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, you were mentioning some aspects of my past, and one I think can explain a little bit my take on technique. Mm -hmm. That I was involved in anarchist and autonomous group, autonomous groups. Um, I'm less involved now for. Um, life reasons to be honest just the time mostly yes. but uh, anarchism is still the let's say the political perspective that i adopt to look at contemporary society mm -hmm. when trying to describe what technique is i think anarchism is a good way to understand it and also looking at current affairs we can understand it mm -hmm. when we look at somebody else when we look at as an object or something we can do it in many different ways one way is to look at the let's say what we can say about that object or that person, the dimensions of that object or of that person or of that creature that fall within language. 
Okay, the things that are, uh, you know, say the categories that we can catalog yeah. about that object. In contemporary, in the contemporary world, this is something that we do uh, automatically almost. Yes. We think that what an object fundamentally is, fundamentally, yeah. is what we can say about it. <clears throat> a recent example has to do where, and I was mentioning anarchism for that, with the problem of nationalities, citizenships, and passports. Yes. There are situations like the ongoing situation of war, uh, in which we, we might be tempted to look at another person and see, first of all, one of the linguistic right. attributes of that person. That person is Russian, Ukrainian, another nationality, okay? That linguistic aspect of that person becomes dominant. So what we encounter, when we encounter another person, we don't encounter an ineffable mystery. We don't encounter, as Ivan, the philosopher Emmanuel Levina used to say, the face of God in the face of the person. Yes. We meet a nationality. Yeah. So we meet an item of language. Mm -hmm. Now, you can see already, considering the current situation, what happens when you start treating people like that. Mm -hmm. You could also imagine this easier if, the, if you consider the, the ecological dimension when we meet a forest or an animal or an ecosystem and we don't meet an ineffable mystery of life with an agency of its own and so on and so forth, with something that escapes our understanding and that demands our respect. But we encounter a catalog of resources that we can adopt in our production. Mm -hmm. Once again, we have that form of relationship in which we destroy the other. Yes. We reduce it to an item of language. And we include that other within the big language of society to the extent to which it is reducible to the language of society. Anything else, any dimension of that person or of that object or of that creature that don't fall within the language, don't exist. Hmm. Now, this is a particular way of looking at the world. It's not the only way in which we always have looked at the world, we human species. There is, a history. Sorry? there is an history of the, the ways of dealing and looking at the world. Absolutely. Yes. Anthropologists, I, I think, for example, uh, of uh, Philippe Collat, more recently mm -hmm. in his book, yes. Beyond Nature and Culture, mm -hmm. have been observing and mapping for a long time how different civilizations, cultures, groups have looked at the world in different ways. And we have an incredible amount of different ways of making reality appear to us. The one that we have today, in which we look at things through the, the grid of language, we have an availability of different technical languages, mm -hmm. finance, science, chemistry, citizenship, uh, ethnicity, gender, and, and so on and so forth, and we filter it yes. through this grid, is one particular way of making reality appear to us. Different civilizations, today and in the past have done this exercise of making reality appear to us in different, completely different ways. Each of them has consequences. There is no perfect way of doing this. And each of them always leaves something out. The one that we have today, I think is especially um, dangerous in a sense, on the one hand, because it produces consequences such as uh, a dehumanization of the other in the case of war, but also of border control. So we let somebody pass a border if they have a little piece of paper where there is a linguistic section on citizenship, or we, we let them to drown in the Mediterranean Sea. Mm -hmm. So it is mm -hmm. traumatic, yes. consequences. Yeah. traumatic consequences environmentally. We are unable to see anything but resources and we still I have the idea of managing <laughs> uh, other forms of life, uh, which is, Unfortunately, this disgusting idea, we also apply to each other, even within the same species. Um, this leads to also a difficult way of existing within the world, even for us. Because if what exists of us is what can be said, what can be catalogued, measured, recombined linguistically, then the problem is that when we fall out of some of these linguistic definitions, um, when, for example, we fall out of the language of um, employability or of the language of gender recognition in the case of transgen transgender people or um, in the case of people without passports, um, stateless people in the, uh, falling out of um, 
the language of citizenship. In the case of people with forms of grief that are not immediately medicalized, uh, falling out of the language of recognized pain, and so on and so forth. Well, we fall out of existence to a certain extent. We become less than we were before. This makes life very dangerous because you are constantly under the blackmail that you can be progressively erased from the world to the point in which you no longer exist, technically, and yet you're still alive. A lot of people experience this today. So this is, um, let's say, a way of looking at technique by describing more the symptoms of it than the metaphysics. The metaphysics would require a bit of a longer explanation. Um, but maybe this is a, an interesting way to approach one aspect of the way in which we make reality appear to us today. And one of the reasons why we might want to think about an alternative system, keeping in mind that an alternative system of reality is always possible. Because reality comes to us through a filter that we adopt. I'm going to go a little bit in depth in this, uh, just one minute. Um, I know it's a bit more complicated and specialistic, but it is, I think it is important to keep this in mind. When we make sense of the perceptions that we have, and we have all the perceptions simultaneously, for example, when you're looking at the room around yourself right now, you perceive the whole room simultaneously, and you perceive all the things at once, all the sensations at once, then you make order out of this avalanche of sensations and perceptions, and you structure them. And in your mind, you create reality. This activity of structuring, making order, the Greeks would say making cosmos, the cosmos is the order, can be done in many different ways. And there is not one way which is correct. The way which would be which is correct, unfortunately, is the one um, that we cannot deal with to experience everything at once in its perfect disorder. We don't do that. At least we human beings, we, we need to have some order, hmm? which means a, a system. But this system can be done in many different ways. The animist system, for example, that you find in uh, uh, many parts of the Amazon forest, is completely different from the system that we adopt in technique today. And the one that we have adopted today is not the final one. Even, even here in Europe, we had different systems in the past, which made reality appear in different ways, which gave us different worlds to live in, made our life uh, a different type of challenge, uh, told us that certain things were possible and others were impossible, differently from the way it is today. And we will have new ones in the future. I'm suggesting here simply to uh, approach this proactively. It's, it's, it is a terrible word, but yes. <clears throat> creatively, so to say, creatively, mm -hmm. and understand that we can modify these systems of reality. Yes. Th there is uh, something that we see in your book that is, uh, this is a, um, a philosophical project that came from what you call, call uh, a necessity and kind of urgency also of writing. And it's, it's a, a theory, but it's also something you position yourself in the, in the field of effectiveness. It, it's important for you that philosophy, it's a, a, a way somehow, if I may say, to act. I must say that when I was reading, it's something that I do in, do in general, but I was even extra careful about words because how to speak about in the context of this changing uh, uh, reality system without uh, going too much to to old way of using words. But um, I think that this idea of phil philosophy as a way of being, being effective and of acting, it's something that's important, uh, important also to to your project. Mm. Absolutely, yes. And of course, I'm not original in this. I'm just yeah. anachronistic. Yeah. I'm anachronistic in the sense that the idea that philosophy has to serve a function yeah. so that it has to inter to be a tool in your life to live better, fundamentally. Yeah. And that it has to suggest uh, a, not just a series of concepts that you can repeat in a dinner party, but a, a way of life yes 
Well, this is a very ancient idea. This is, it was the typical way in which philosophy was uh, experienced in antiquity, yeah. all the way to late antiquity. There is a beautiful book by Pierre Hadot called Philosophy as a Way of Life, yeah. which explores exactly how <clears throat> for a very long time, philosophy was considered to be this. Then progressively, as capitalism, for example, in suggested a, um, a specialization, a division of labor within society, uh, then also philosophy started to become a specialized field, which provides one thing, concepts. <clears throat> I don't think that's what philosophy should do. And I think that, um, or at least providing concepts is not the only thing that philosophy should do, also providing concepts, but for what reason? To find out the truth about the world? Not so much, because the truth about reality is, is beyond our reach. We are uh, limited cognitive machines. You know, we, we are not divinities. We are limited biological cognitive machines that perceive the world within our limits. The absolute truth about reality is beyond our grasp for the simple reason that if it was within our grasp, it would mean that the world has been created to coincide speci specifically with our cognitive yeah. limits. This is absurd. Yeah. So philosophy cannot have the uh, ambition of finding out the truth in that sense, but can have the ambition of finding out a way to make sense of reality that allows us to lead a dignified life. Mm. Mm. So yes, I, I take inspiration from some of the, the earlier forms of philosophy. Plato himself yes. was, was trying to do something like this. I'm not, of course, trying to say that I, I am continuing Plato's work, but I am in that tradition, dialogue, a long tradition, which yes. is a typical Mediterranean tradition as well. That was another question that I have because uh, I, I feel that your your book is quite. It's also quite a situated philosophy because it's situated in Mediterranean. You go to a very uh, uh, Persian traditions to Arab thought. Uh, also to Portuguese po poetry, to, to Pessoa, and to, uh, so it's something that is made in this region, also uh, looking to, to practices uh, that perhaps were put uh, <coughs> tied during the, the, the construction of this reality, system of reality that uh, you call technique. So I would like yeah. you to speak a little bit about this references that and this this uh, connection also with the arab world and with this mediterranean world well there's a number of reasons why i specialize in the mediterranean to a certain extent or i concentrate on the mediterranean yes it's not because the mediterranean is the most interesting area of the world there are many other areas that are equally interesting but first of all the mediterranean is where i come from so i have more experience of that also but also the Mediterranean has one unfortunate uh, situation that, that developed throughout history. It has been always the, um, on the border between different civilizations, societies that were often clashing with each other, mm -hmm. often destroying each other. The territories were passing from one to the other. It was always under the influence of different cultures that were clashing and merging with each other. And it is a land or an expanded area <clears throat> where the experience of defeat has been very present and very common. Mm -hmm. Every single civilization that has appeared, including the greatest ones, has always collapsed. Yeah. For example, my family comes from Sicily and I live in England, so two different islands. England has not been invaded ever since 1066. It's been a thousand, almost a thousand years. Sicily has been invaded since forever, constantly. You know, it, it is a land that is conquered, conquered and conquered once again. So the philosophy that is developed in the Mediterranean is a philosophy that I think feels very close to it. The problem of how to live when, on the one hand, when things are very tough, mm -hmm. on the other, when you realize that the values of a particular society or a particular civilization are not absolute, they're temporary. They are fictitious, they are fictional. Yes. And so you can change them again and again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the Mediterranean, I think, has a special sensitivity in this regard. So that's why I focus so much on the Mediterranean as a source of inspiration. 
And the Mediterranean is very large. Portugal, technically, is not on the Mediterranean. Yes. And, and Persia, the area, the cultural area that I look at very much for many parts, is also not technically in the Mediterranean. But the Mediterranean has this wonderful quality of being, Hillman used to say about Greece, a, a place of the spirit more than a geographical location. It is an attitude. On the one hand, a sensitivity towards pain, which is acute and understands the, the problem of suffering, a sensitivity towards things of the world and reality, which is one of uh, disenchantment, disenchantment towards the world, not disenchantment towards magic, so to say, yeah. but disenchantment towards society, um, the law, authorities, the, a disenchanted attitude towards that. Yes. Um, and also a, 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 an area and a quality of syncretism, so this ability to mesh things together and to not be never really too attached to any specific label or yes. uh, ways of cataloging. So you find the Greeks and the Arabs, the Jews and the Christians, the Hindu, the Zoroastrians, the atheists, the hermetics, and so on, all mashed into one great um, combination with many different facets. Syncretism is one of the things that I find most interesting in the Mediterranean and something that I try to adopt as well. It has to do with the idea of philosophy as a way of life. When you look at philosophy as a way of life, fundamentally, you try to look at ideas and the, the, the world of the mind and of culture as a, as a series of tools that allow you to live a dignified life. Mm -hmm. Where these tools come from, who has put a label on top of them, who they belong to is fairly irrelevant. The point is whether they work or not. You might be born within a particular ethnicity or nationality or culture and find that in your culture, the tools at your disposal are for the most part not useful. Mm -hmm. But in another culture, you find things that are very useful and in another one as well. So you create a system by taking bits. Yes. It's like an attitude of uh, people who survive a shipwreck. You know, you go through the ruins and you, you take it. Yes, exactly. You build a large archive of what it rests and what. <laughs> So, yes. Yeah, and so this is fundamentally what syncretism is, but also it is an attitude towards the letter of things. Mm -hmm. On the surface, um, some things would be incompatible. Uh, so, for example, contemporary and ancient beliefs mm -hmm. are incompatible. The Christian and Muslim beliefs or Greek pagan beliefs are incompatible, and so on and so forth. Some ideas that come from the high culture of the of the masters and some idea that come from the low culture of the, of the slaves, in theory are incompatible. But in practice, from the existential attitude of a single person that is facing the challenge of having to restructure the idea of the world, everything is possible, you know, everything is available. Yes. Um, it's a, it's in, I was listening to you and you only speaking about the Mediterranean. I, I felt that you were speaking about a lot of things that are important for the building of this um, magic uh, system of reality, because you spoke about uh, this idea of syncretism and this, this kind of weaving, perhaps you can call it also weaving of these different uh, um, I will not call it resources <laughs> because it's not, but have these different uh, also existences somehow. Uh, you spoke, of, uh, you also put yourself in the place yeah, and you think mm -hmm. from the place of your existency, and perhaps I'll ask you to speak a lot, uh, a little bit about this. Uh, you speak about this not to attach, uh, that it's a place where you can learn not to attach too much to things because of all this constant uh, changing and of this uh, also some violence and difficult encounters. Uh, so this importance of distance uh, that I found also in, in your philosophy. Um, and this also, and perhaps I would like to start by here, this idea of the experience of collapse, of defeat, the, the sensibility towards the pain and this is something that, um, well, in a, I think that it's in your book, you are not showing us that you, we are in a shifting, shifting point between different reality systems, but perhaps we can be if we do it. Uh, so, and 
pain and uh, defeat, collapse, depression, all these uh, things that in the uh, world of language and the dominant world in which we live in technique, they are quite negative. Uh, but you found a kind of uh, potency, a kind of strength. Uh, I don't know if, if it's the right world, but it's a starting point mm. for the reconstruction of reality that you propose. So can you speak a little bit yeah. about this? I think starting point is is a is a is a, is a good way of, of describing it. And first of all, in, in case anyone is uh, curious about the book, um, it's not a depressing book about pain. No, not at all. Not, like at all. not at all. It's not at all. I try to to consider uh, some aspects of our contemporary experience of reality in its in its problems, to yeah, try to find a way to overcome them practically, right. also, and to create a new starting point. Um, you were mentioning the question of attachments. In order to, to transform our idea of reality today, it is necessary to detach ourselves from the ideas that we have about reality today. I'm not suggesting a complete form of detachment, um, you know, like advanced Buddhism, but in a, but a, a more specific form of metaphysical detachment. Mm. So a detachment from the ideas that we have ingrained in this particular society about what reality is, how we make it appear, what we see when we encounter a person or an object or a creature, and so on and so forth. What is it? What is real? What is unreal? What is imaginary? What is physical? So on the one hand, detaching ourselves from that, and on the other hand, attaching ourselves to something else. It would be fantastic to live perfectly detached, but I have not thought of writing a, a, a manual for saints uh, I am. I, I've thought of writing more, more, more modestly uh, a suggestion for us, for norm, normal, life. normal people, eh? on how to reconstruct reality. And of course, when you reconstruct reality, you have to always have a starting point and a point of balance and a point of, of stability. You have to fix your stability somewhere. <clears throat> Let me try to explain a little bit this. When you create a perspective in a painting, for example, a linear perspective, you always have a blind point, which is, the, 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 which is also the starting point, the point from which the perspective appears. Mm -hmm. It's arbitrary, but it is the place from which the kind of like the lines start to spread. When you create a system in mathematics, in geometry, you always have to start with some assumptions. Even, even in uh, perfectly uh, logical systems like mathematics and geometry, there are some immediate assumptions at the, at the very, very beginning, which are not demonstrable or proven. Mm -hmm. They are axioms. That's the technical term. So there are starting points that are say like, this is it. We start saying this, 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 and then we create the system. Mm -hmm. Having a point of departure is important. In technique, so to say, so in the contemporary world, we have decided to put our point of departure in the idea of language. So in the idea that there are categories and systems of organization, which are logical, measurable, uh, serial, and so on and so forth. I discussed this in the book, mm -hmm. that we can take as the starting point to create reality. Okay, but this has certain consequences. I suggest to have another starting point to create reality. Also, this has consequences. Yes. Creates a different field of the possible. The different um, starting point that I suggest coincides in part with the things that are um, excluded from the perspective of the contemporary Western society, of contemporary technique. I call it the ineffable, which is um, that which is beyond words, beyond language, what is totally unmeasurable, totally unspeakable. <clears throat> also, this is a very ancient idea. You find this a lot in especially late ancient Mediterranean philosophy, from Plotinus all the way to Ibn Arabi in the, in the Middle Ages, and then Meister Eckhart and later on. Using that as the point of departure means that when we look at ourselves, we no longer, when I look at myself, I no longer see myself as a male, 
uh, Italian of a certain height, of a certain financial value and molecular composition and so on and so forth, sexual preferences. But I see that fundamentally I am something beyond words. The thing within me that thinks, the thing within me that calls itself Federico is not Federico. The thing that thinks my thoughts is none of my thoughts. It is a thinking beyond thoughts. It is a voice beyond words. And thus, when I look at you, I see that, yes, of course, I see Liliana, a woman, blah, 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 and so on. But in fact, what I am seeing is something that is beyond description. And then we have this surface, this surface of, recu- you know, of image, yes. which also is sus- susceptible to be linguistically catalogued. Mm-hmm. That's okay, but that's not all. I'm not suggesting to abandon language. I'm suggesting to put the, the point, you know, when you use, a, when you use like when a, one of those compasses like this, yes. you know, to, to set the yeah. point in that, in the self-perception and in the perception of the other. Yes, you are, you are not suggesting to abandon language, but you are suggesting to uh, abandon the kind of absolute use of language that we are doing. That's like confounding, uh, thinking that reality can be uh, equal to language. Yes. So that can be said. So it's more this, deplay, this change, this shift. It's a kind of changing, a movement of changing, deplacing language, even if not. Uh, yes. Pessoa. That's why Pessoa features also very much in, in the book that you kindly mentioned, yeah. Technical Magic. Yes. So it gives a great example of how it is possible to imagine, understand the ways in which we exist as Liliana, as Federico, as a mushroom, and so on and so forth, on a surface level. While in, in fact, indeed, there is underneath something which is beyond words. Alberto Caero says that nature has no insight. Yes. Which, which can be interpreted in many different ways. And I interpret it in the sense that it does have an insight, but this insight is not an insight. It's not a thing. It's something beyond words. You find the same in the Upanishads when they talk about the Atman. The essence of a person is something entirely beyond conceptualization, but this, the essence of any object also is. Hmm. find it in Islam, in Sufism, and in uh, Shia mysticism. I look at Surah Vardi in particular there, Mullah Sadra, when the, the idea that <clears throat> this thing, which is beyond words and which we fundamentally are, is our existence. Hmm. The fact that we exist, the thing that keeps us up, you know, I am here because I exist. Yes. Now, this mystery of the fact that I exist is not a mystery that happened when I was born once and that, and then you go on, my, my, my child. But it's happening every single moment. I am existing right now and right now and right now. So I have this thing, which is existence, that keeps me up. That thing, which expresses itself as my awareness, okay, that's me. That thing is beyond words. Is mm-hmm. one of those things that Kant would say fall into the noumenon. So in, in that beyond our ability to conceptualize and think and perceive, we know it's there, but we cannot say anything about it. Yeah. That, that thing is in me and is in you, but also is identical in me and in you. Because existence and awareness beyond words, also existence and awareness beyond words in you, and also in this pen. Mm-hmm. Now <clears throat> If we start, if we use this as a starting point to observe reality and to consider what we see within rea- in, in reality when we encounter others, uh, we, we start to structure differently our approach to each other, to ourselves, and to the world. Language is, a, is necessary in the sense that, well, very much like a surface, like a membrane, like to have a contact with somebody. Mm-hmm. If, you, if you're in love with somebody, and you touch them, the point is you don't want to touch their skin. You want to go beyond. Mm -hmm. And yet, the way in which we go beyond is by touching each other's skin. Even though that's not the point. But when you're in love, you understand clearly, immediately, that that is the limit of our meeting. But you you are capable at the same time to go beyond. Yes. In contemporary society, we seem to be unable to understand that language 
is the limit of our meeting, images, perceptions, and so on and so forth, and yet that we can go beyond. Yeah. In terms of what you were saying, just to, to conclude about shifting, shifting uh, our idea of reality, um, just one, one note in the sense that I was not, never suggesting a, a social revolution, simply for the reason that it's not something that has ever particularly interested me. Social revolutions, when there is a massive shift, which is coordinated and engineered simultaneously, it's usually bad news. Mm. What I'm suggesting is something for each individual person. In that sense, whether or not society is moving towards a metaphysical change, which they do happen in time, of course, or not, is irrelevant. In our own individual life, we can always do it. But if existence is present in everyone, in everything, in every, so the individual uh, transformation, it creates like waves, uh, I imagine. I don't know if you, <clears throat> waves of uh, mm. um, contact and waves of that are effective perhaps in a larger uh, where the individual it's not a, a closed <laughs> a closed entity or a, it's at the same know. time at the same at the same time a closed entity and an open entity yes the paradox so perhaps you can speak a little bit about the role of paradox in magics and we enter a little bit bit more in magic realm of reality yeah i mean once again this idea is 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 not an original idea i, I mean I, I i take pride in presenting some necessary, I believe, ideas, yeah. uh, not so much inventing them myself. I present them and often I take them from other sources, which I always uh, declare. Mm -hmm. One of these sources, and to be honest, we find this idea of the paradox in many different places, but it's especially interesting in Nicolas of Cusa, who was mm -hmm. a Renaissance philosopher. And in, he used this expression, coincidencia oppositorum, the coincidence of opposites. So the idea that <clears throat> it is possible to have particular things, for example, God, that is capable of keeping within itself things that in theory are incompatible. I, I ex expand and apply this idea also to each one of us and to each thing that exists. At the same time, I am something beyond words and so on and so forth, and so are you. And at the same time, I have a linguistic surface, which is you know, the fluorescent and constantly moving, like liquid glass. Imagine like liquid colored glass that moves, okay? Yeah. Something like that. <clears throat> the two things at the same time. <clears throat> um, the, the idea of the paradox and the idea of this coincidence of opposites is a suggestion, and you, you find it towards the end of the book. So it, it takes a while to get there. I try to, to, to build up a, a let's say, a path to get to the point in which it, we, we are capable of looking at things in the world and understand them paradoxically at the same time as linguistically classifiable for real, okay? So yeah. we, don't, we don't abandon that entirely, mm -hmm. but we understand that it is fictional, a yes. necessary yes. fiction. It's a necessary fiction. Yes. And at the same time, we understand that there is an element of total ineffability and silence. On the one hand, for example, we understand that there is time, such a thing as time, which might be conventional, everything you want, the, the counting of change according to, to before and after, said Aristotle. And yet it is an, you know, a fictional but necessary way in which we approach our experience. And yet we understand that there is also eternity within time. Both at the same time. <clears throat> this allows us, um, I think, to consider, for example, that reality as we experience it and our own life is fictional and senseless mm -hmm. and yet at the same time it is a field where we can creatively create make sense and inhabit it and this can can give us a, the experience of a dignified life a life of joy mm -hmm. and yet at the same time not to be too attached to it and not to be too afraid of what comes before and after life mm -hmm. um, because we understand that this particular illusion or this particular fiction is only a fiction, okay? It is technically a game. Okay, let's remain one second on this. A game is something which is very real when you play it. It is delimited in a field 
It is fictional, as fictional rules, but once you, once you enter it, it's totally You're real. completely there. <laughs> yes. It, it is fun, yes. or it can be fun, because it's limited, because it's fictional. If it wasn't limited and it wasn't fictional, it would be a nightmare. It would be like a horror film in which, which you're trapped inside a game. Okay. Technic has this quality of turning the fiction, the game fiction of, of life into an, a total nightmare, inescapable. You can't go out of it. I try to, re, to emphasize again this ability of staying with one foot in and one foot outside of the game. Yes. And it's, uh, in fact, you, you came to this point that I wanted also to address, that it's the, the importance of fiction, because uh, in more, perhaps, a general uh, uh, understanding of fiction, we can create oppositions between fiction and reality. But here, and going to Kant, to Hans Weinger, and to, you really show how fiction can be also a, a co constitutive part of reality, uh, and uh, but I, I don't know if you want to to and it somehow it it what allows us it seems to me to and I think you say that in the book uh, to not to think that the magic will be the new uh, it's the truth the magic system of reality it's not the truth it's not what can come and substitute the techniques it's one of the main possibilities of uh, it's one of the main no it's one of the possibilities of uh, create to create reality uh, to create reality systems that it's somehow plural uh, mm -hmm. here and taking this in consideration this role of the as if the, the reality as if and of fiction perhaps I would like you to speak a little bit about um, how do you understand this idea of reality? Uh, so what it is, this, uh, you, you dedicate some, some uh, pages to this uh, uh, concept. Oh. And now, uh, I don't know if you can summarize it a little bit. Far. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I can try to, to look at the whole thing yes. uh, at once. Okay, well, let's, let's begin by looking at fiction, maybe. Yes. <clears throat> so we have, uh, at the moment, I, I work in a publishing house. Uh, I've been working in publishing for many years. And in publishing, at least in the UK, in, in, in English speaking publishing, there is a distinction between fiction and non-fiction. Yes, a category. You know, a category, which is, which is useful because it basically it gives, us, gives you an idea, you know, more or less of let's say more of the kind of like vibe and use of that text that you can that you can do yeah. it's fine metaphysically speaking so in terms of looking at the essence of things it's it's a very it's, it's a very fine line between the two mm -hmm. fiction and non-fiction to a certain extent there is no line everything to a certain extent is fiction every idea that we have every perception that we have around ourselves is fictional is in from 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 the from the very Latin term, which means to make. Mm -hmm. This room that I see around myself, I make. I am not experiencing it outside of me. I am experiencing it within myself. And you looking at this right now, you're not looking at us. We exist within your mind. Yeah. We do not exist outside of your mind. Nothing exists outside of your mind. In you know, or or your perceptions, mm -hmm. or your physical self and and sensitive apparatus, and so. You create it as an image within yourself. In that sense, it's fictional. But also it's fictional because you create it in a particular way. So it's artificial. You create it according to particular methods of making it. Some of them are biological. For example, we human beings, we experience things in space and time. That's, and you know, so we are bound to that experience. Some of them are cultural, for example. Uh, we now, in, in the West, we, we have some automatic ways of thinking. So when we encounter somebody, we encounter, for example, we immediately notice the gender mm. of another person. And so like, I meet a woman or I meet a man. This is an auto, almost automatic reflex, but it is a cultural reflex. It's not a biological reflex. And it is artificial. So my mind is populated by women and men. And this is a fictional part of my mind. 
I could, it could be populated also by in other completely different ways. <clears throat> For example, the fact that we encounter matter or materials and animals. Not all cultures consider have such ideas as matter. In some, for some other people, in their mind, they don't create the, mm -hmm. the fictional character of matter. So reality is fictional in the in this fundamental sense. Also, it is non-fictional in the sense that we, if we are inside this game, it is necessary that we suspend our disbelief. Mm -hmm. Imagine watching a film and constantly thinking that, oh, these are actors, actors, actors. Mm -hmm. You the experience. Yes. If you play a game and you constantly think, this is meaningless, this is fake, this is not the truth, you cannot play it. I think that it's in 20 years later, uh, you know, Dumas, the author of The Three Musketeers, mm -hmm. wrote the second part. And in the second part, the three musketeers are very old. And one of them, I think Portos, is, is doing a plot, is putting a bomb somewhere, mm -hmm. ignites the bomb and runs away from the bomb. And while running, at some point, starts thinking, how is it possible that my mind can control my legs and I can run? How does this happen? It doesn't make sense. And so it stops running, exploding. It's not practical. Yes. <laughs> okay. it's not practical. So, <laughs> no, exactly. So yeah. it is necessary that we also keep it as non-fiction that we hold it as real. But it is useful to keep these two parts together, exactly like we do in games, you know, when we, when we are capable of being, on the one hand, inside and outside. In games, when you are capable of doing this, for example, it's called fair play. Fair play means that you're capable of playing and at the same time understanding that there are things outside of the game, values outside of the game, truths outside of the game Thank that you can bring in when necessary. Sorry? Ethics, perhaps, also outside our dear places. Ethics also. Ethics is a complicated aspect yeah. because also ethics is fictional. Yes. You know, in, in, in that sense, like our notion of good or, or bad depends yes. on the particular way in which we construct the world. In, in, um, in, in playing, fair play is usually seen as ethics in the sense of like I bring superior values, like I respect my opponent, okay, mm -hmm. for example. But I think what is very powerful there is not so much the bringing external values in, but in relativizing, so making relative, so not holding as absolute, mm -hmm. the values that you have inside the game. Yes. So this is to a certain extent real, to a certain extent not real. And then it comes to your sensitivity to understand when the game has gone too far. Mm -hmm. Okay. For example, when going back to one of early examples, if you decide that you hold the game, a game according to which we, the world is separated in states and nations and ethnicities, which are entirely fictional characters, Mediterranean people know this very well. Okay? I come from Sicily. What is the Sicilian ethnicity? Doesn't even make sense to say this. We are so totally mixed. What is our nation? We have never had native people. Sicily had native peoples in the times of the Stone Age. But if, like th thousands of years before Christ, our native people have been erased. Yes. We Like the state, what does it even mean? Citizenship and so on and so forth. When you see that this particular game produces consequences such as thousands of children dying and you witness the horror of lives being extinguished and actual pain, then you might decide that the game has gone too far. Mm -hmm. And it's not so much of bringing a superior value from somewhere else, but having that also elegance. I know it sounds like a, a, a very weak word when confronted with horror, but sometimes I think is actually the best way to approach this, of understanding that that particular game has gone too far and remind yourself, this is a fiction. So I, can, I have to tune it down sometimes. You know, I have to remind myself, this is too much. Yes. And I cannot allow this fiction to rule my life, <laughs> okay? And to, yeah. especially to destroy other lives. To go over existences. Yes. Exactly. No, it's, uh, because uh, when you do that, you are being superstitious. Hmm. In this society in which we no longer believe in religions, we laugh at the savages and all their churches and all that kind of stuff. Well, in reality, this is the, one, the most superstitious society ever. Religious societies at least understand that there is an aspect of reality, which is the Godhead, the divinity, which is beyond our understanding, and all our means are limited, and all our cultural ideas are fictional in the face of God. In our secular society, where we are so smart and non-believers, 
in fact, we are so attached to our linguistic ideas and our idea of reality that we, we believe it to be true and absolutely true and real. This is idolatrous superstition of the worst kind. So, so somehow uh, magic, it's a way to liberate ourselves of superstition. Something that Paradoxically, it, yes. yes. This is paradoxically, yes. But that's why I talk when sometimes I'm, I'm, uh, I'm asked to comment on the disenchantment of the world. Mm -hmm. As if it was a bad thing, the disenchantment. I'm saying like, disenchantment is a great thing. But mm -hmm. our society is not disenchanted. Our society is totally enchanted. Yes. We believe in crazy things. We believe in, in um, well, looking at even just at the financial institutions that we have created mm -hmm. and the way we allow them to rule our lives. Mm -hmm. These are fictional creations even mu much more unreal than the archangels <laughs> described by Gnostic mystics in some, um, you know, oasis in the desert in late antiquity. The financial institutions or institutions of citizenship are fantasies, and we are completely enchanted by that. Disenchantment, yes, if only. So magic is disenchanting in that sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think that we are some of approaching also our, our time, but uh, that there's a lot, a lot more in your book uh, to speak and in different levels. Um, but I would like, we went through, through a lot of points I wanted to speak with you, but I would like to, to ask you about it, coming back also to, to the beginning when I did your presentation. And for me, presentations are like, pointing trajectories uh, and now you are um, related to contemporary art spaces like the Rivoli, you are philosopher in residence in Rivoli Contemporary Art Museum, you have this podcast that is also hosted by a, a contemporary art center and I was thinking that in this world of technique, in this reality of technique, art, it's a lot of times this space also where um, um, that sometimes it's reserved this ma magic reality uh, mm. uh, or magic uh, system of reality. So I wonder if you can speak a little bit about this, about this, uh, or if you have any thoughts about this. this. Well, the, con the contemporary art world. Well, yes, but mostly oh, because it's it, it's a place that uh, that somehow it's it's a place that somehow it's uh, reserved in the world of techniques for the imagination for for the imaginary. Yeah, yeah, that you also say that it's one necessity, very important necessity of doing this philosophical project is also this crisis of imaginary. Uh, but somehow. Um, uh, the, the world of techniques it creates this this safe space somehow that sometimes it's contemporary art <laughs> yeah or a ghetto depends how you want yes, to see it. I work a lot in contemporary art spaces but I think this can be uh, <laughs> also seen through this way <laughs> yeah I mean the contemporary art world is uh, I mean it's slightly similar in a certain to a certain sense also with philosophy in the sense that, uh, first of all, I work very often with contemporary arts, yes. even just for the simple reason that if you want to discuss philosophy today, either you do in academia in a particular form, so usually to discuss specific, to resolve specific conceptual problems, mm -hmm. so in analytic philosophy, which is dying as, an ex as a tradition, um, supplanted by computers, to be honest, mm -hmm. or you go into contemporary arts yes. or nowhere else. There is nowhere else. Yes. It seems as if the problem of how to live a dignified life is not a problem. You know, we don't have that problem today. What we need is some sentimental responses. You know, that's why we have entertainment. Entertainment has taken the place of philosophy and has taken the place of art as well. You know, this, this general layer of entertainment in which basically it's the same as anesthetics. The point is not to try to live a dignified life, but to keep to manage the pain. Yes. There is no possible way out. We cannot change this. This is unchangeable. This is the idea, of course. You know, you are what you are and things that are as they are. 
So just entertain yourself a little bit. Mm -hmm. As I say, kill time before time kills you. And so philosophy is totally useless. In the case of art, the art world has been slightly luckier, or maybe not, in the sense that it is also a hobby for a lot of rich people. A lot of rich people have the hobby of doing this because, you know, God knows why, maybe because they have nothing better to do. And so they, they tend to finance it more. And so you, contemporary art has more of a space in which it exists. But similarly to philosophy, is entirely depotentiated. You know, it is a hobby, okay, for most people. Now, <clears throat> this is the way in which we are included. In the experience that I have of people that work in the arts, as in the experience that I have of fellow philosophers, we are colleagues. You know, we, we are trying to do something that is constantly devaluated and, <laughs> and considered fundamentally useless. Mm -hmm. okay? If it was useful, for example, it would be really democratized. You know, philosophy would be for everyone, and art would be truly for everyone, but in a serious way, not in a you know, it would be a, a compulsory subject at school, but not in the sense of like cutting shapes on a colored piece of paper or in the sense that philosophy is not even a compulsory subject in, in England, it's disappeared entirely. And so we, we try to, we find ourselves in this strange position of impostors. We know very well that we have to try to sell what we do, you know, to people that don't appreciate it, to a society that doesn't understand it in any way and that finds it entirely useless while at the same time we understand that it is actually immensely useful. And so we have to play this double role. And so on the one hand, like, you know, like playing that game and then trying actually to do something and trying to push it somehow in a place where it can be visible, right. not for fame or money. Neither mm -hmm. of these two exist. Maybe fame exists, but money certainly not. Mm -hmm. um, but also for a sense of responsibility, you know, towards uh, fellow people like us. And this sensitivity, I think, is useful. I mean, there is a certain element of disenchantment, once again, and irony that you find in the arts, not so much in the works, but in the people. That I think is especially interesting. The works, to a certain extent, are the, the surface. And in, in as much as they are the surface, they have to play that game. But then yeah. the artists and the curators have a particular sensitivity in the art world, at least today, which I think makes them privileged interlocutors for philosophers. And so it, it, that's how I see this alliance, an alliance, alliance of uh, traitors, you know, oh, yeah. try to play this double game. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that place where we can find also starting points somehow, perhaps, mm. yeah, in the world. Um, okay. okay, I think that, I don't know if you want to, if you'd like to add something, uh, um, we could... Uh, well, I think we could go on and on because your book, it's really something I, I want to, I feel like reading and reading again because we, did, we didn't we didn't to, we didn't went to this more, perhaps I may say, analytic aspects of the architecture of, uh, of uh, technique, the architecture of magic, how to really, you really show the building blocks of this uh, uh, two ways of uh, constructing reality um, of, or of making reality appear. Um, but I think that it's, we need the experience of the book also <laughs> for that. Um, but I don't know if you want to, to add something. No, no. Thank you for, no, no, it, it, was, it was great talking with you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. And best of luck for the, for the first edition. Of thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much. So thank you very much for, for this conversation. Uh, and we we will move forward. This this some of those questions will appear during uh, the, the the program of Index two thousand and two. So thank you again. Ciao. Ciao.